Hi, everybody. Welcome again to another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. John, Phil, and Logan today with you for episode number 144. Talking today about some updates and new things going on here at Woodsmith and Popular Woodworking and Shop Notes magazine, and also some projects that we've been working on at home. I want to thank Tight Bond for their sponsorship of this episode. You want a glue that you can trust, and fortunately, Tight Bond has the glue you need to get the job done with confidence. From interior glues with strong initial tack and short clamp time to exterior glues with exceptional strength and water resistance, look to Tightbond, the right glue for your next project. For more information, visit tightbond.com. I feel like there's an opportunity here for like a Tightbond for those of you who'd like to be in a sticky situation or... <laughs> Like, stick I feel like tight bond or stick with tight. Yeah, like come on. Bond, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Helping you with we'll work sticky on it. situations. We'll put our ad brains together. Come up with something, <laughs> right? I feel like it's like the uh, the April Fool's Day ad for tight bond, right? You know, maybe. I will say that uh, ever since, as part of their sponsorship, they supply glue for TV show stuff which means I use their glue for my personal projects that I'm working on over my lunch period. And their speed set glue, which I've, I'll admit I was reticent at first because the last thing I need is glue to seize up faster. But I do love the speed set glue. It has come to be one of my favorites. Well, when stuff goes together easily. Yeah maybe a little too easily it's like let's just get this over with why i mean like yeah let's just do it you know yeah because i will say prior to this i was a, and we've talked about this before a liquid hide glue and tight bond three Mm -hmm. kind of person i didn't mess around with the other versions of tight bond the original or tight bond two nothing against them i used them all in the past but to me tight bond three did everything that the other ones do and I just didn't need to keep another bottle around. But I do now keep a bottle of the speed set around. So I've become a three glue person. That's how it starts. Yep. (laughs) Next thing, next thing, you know, you have a little tiny bottle of glue in your pocket at all times. Yeah. Going to dinner, you have a tiny bottle of glue. It's a gateway adhesive. (laughs) You know, that's how they get you hooked. (laughs) Although that does bring up the topic of a routine conversation that happens in our house of whenever laundry gets done and (laughs) the way we divide it is my wife does the laundry and I usually do all the cooking and cleaning up the kitchen and stuff. But during laundry, she'll come up and be like, guess what I found in your pockets? Router bit. Router bit, bunch of screws. Small handful of sawdust, maybe like a dowel yep. or, you know, a washer or three or something like that. It's like, or she'll just come up and just like pour out a little onto the counter and be like, how do you know you're married to a woodworker? Yep. I do my laundry separately from everybody else's for this very reason, especially <laughs> when it's like, especially when it's like chainsaw season, oh, because yeah. Chainsaw chips are bad. Right. And there's sometimes where you're cutting and it's filling your pockets up and you know, there's nothing you can do about it. Oh, yeah. I mean, so yeah. Super funny. Although in, in a corollary to that, I have a, I don't know, little drawer in the house. Kind of when I come home that I can kind of, put my keys and wallet and stuff in just to have like a landing place for it. And that little valet, I guess we could call it Mm -hmm. has a wide variety of onesie twosie little wood screws and a quarter inch dowel and odd little things that I just never take out of there. Yeah. I'm really good about walking off with pencils and tape measures. So (laughs) after about a week or two, I got to, Start bringing them all back. Yep. So I need a little I've, tote to put them all in and carry them back. 
I've had a little miniature Chuck key sitting on my dresser for about a year now. All right. <laughs> it just sits there in between my tub of clothes because it was in my pocket at one point. And I just never really did anything with it. Yeah. I had a rabbiting bit in my uh, cup holder for probably six months. <laughs> so I don't know. It's just yeah. there yeah. when I need it. Yeah. So speaking of, you had mentioned chainsaw work. Mm-hmm. It was slightly more than a year ago, Logan, that you helped me with felling several trees in my yard. Yeah. And I kept a couple of blocks of the of the two soft maples just to have around for yep. projects, various projects, various projects. And I made one... Uh, kind of a greenwood canister that I carved different elements that reminds us of the tree on it. And then the other part of the block I had just kind of sitting in the, in my workshop and I had it Mm -hmm. in a trash bag tied up uh, to keep it moist. Yep. And I finally had the chance slash took the chance to do some stuff in my workshop before it got super cold this last week. Mm -hmm. And I was working on a a flower scoop. I'll put a photo of it on the show notes page. Because one of our traditions at home is uh, Friday night pizza and movie night. Yep. And I make my own pizza dough. And I have a tub in the kitchen of bread flour separate from our all-purpose flour and needed a scoop for it and I thought well it's been a while since I made a spoon so I thought I'd make some from that soft maple and I was worried that having been a year since the tree was down that the wood Mm -hmm. and being maple which is not my favorite wood at all yeah. would be really hard but it actually cut surprisingly well and it was still yeah. remarkably and, moist yeah and it is soft maple let's be yeah true it is but it's still i mean soft maple is still harder than cherry yeah you know but it still yeah. cut real well like it was pretty green yet and i was also expecting it to have that same sort of funk that you had when you were trying to make your own spalted wood <laughs> yeah, the, in the trash bag. The beer and wet sweatshirt kind of yeah. Yeah. Yep. aroma. Yeah. But it didn't. But it didn't. No, it was hmm, still pretty cool. clear. So, No, it's funny. I, I've i always been surprised how well putting a bag around a blank keeps it moist. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. if, and I found that if I'm turning something wet and I want to come back and work on it the next day without it being all cracked and distorted, throw a bag out. Like usually I'll actually spritz it with water and then I'll put a bag. Over yeah. It. So, yeah. And I had gotten this mostly roughed out and wanted to do some final work on it, but just kind of ran out of time. And so I put it in a Ziploc bag and then just put a little bit of water on the inside and some of it kind of yeah. absorbed into it. But then when I went back to work on it, it was still real easy to, to cut in fact probably was a little easier to cut so that was kind of nice so i wanted to try my hand at spoons again for yep want to make a couple of graduation gifts of spoons for some high school graduates you know like a little coffee scoop um, maybe some basic cooking spoons and something like that so we'll have to i wanted to get my get my skills back up. And last year I had made a, you're going to laugh, a spoon mule attachment for my shave horse. So, yep, you guys can Google spoon mule right now. (laughs) I'm thinking of someone that's like sneaking spoons across the border. Sneaking (laughs) spoons across the border. That's exactly right. Where are they hiding them? Yes. (laughs) Spoon mule. Yeah. All right. You're telling this to the wrong people. We're not mature enough to handle this. Oh, my gosh. 
There's a guy who does a lot of green woodworking. His name's Dawson Moore. Goes by the handle on the Instagrams, Michigan Sloyd. Uh, he has plans for a spoon mule that appeared in fine woodworking a couple years ago. I don't have space for a separate spoon mule, so I kind of adapted his design to work with the woodsmith shave horse that we featured a number of years ago. Short story long. And I never really, I built it and seemed like it would work, but I never really tried it on a real spoon until just recently on this scoop and it worked fantastic. So I was kind of, kind of excited about that. Yeah. You know, the shape you have there, I really like, and it's a shape that there's a Turner. Uh, he's from the UK, lives in Australia now. Um, his name is Richard Raffin. And Richard was a production turner for the longest time. So like he would, he would turn stuff as a, for a living. So I don't know if he sold through galleries or, or craft fairs or, you know, what, um, but he sold a, a boatload of stuff. And Richard over the last probably two years has really started to do a lot of YouTube videos. He is an absolute gem of knowledge. Uh, so his videos have been like, I, I watch every single one that he puts up there. Um, even though nothing there is like super groundbreaking, his shapes are just spot on, super fast stuff that easy to make. The scoops are one thing that he does as well. So you turn it basically, if you think like a goblet, you know, oh, yeah. you would turn it like a goblet and then you just bandsaw it in half and it makes a really nice shape. Um, and you can make them as big or as small as you want, which is super cool. So good shape. I like, I think that that'll be a, that's that's something I've wanted to do for a while is some scoops like that. Yeah. And I still have a bunch of that uh, maple that I have left over. So it's kind of a fun connection to have from it. I was inspired for the design by... Hold, please. Hold, please. By this book mm. called Spoon, oddly enough, written by a fella named Barn the Spoon. Mm. Okay. We'll put a link for Seems that. Seems like when his parents named him, they kind of pigeonholed <laughs> him into that. Right. <laughs> you know. Uh, it's been a really cool book. I've I've really enjoyed it. So, I'll, like I said, I'll put a link on the show notes page for that one. His real name is Barnaby Carter. C A R D E R. Mm. Mm. Okay. There you go. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. You know, okay, so kind of switching gears, this is something that when you said, you said drawer earlier, Phil talking about um, your ballet and stuff. Yeah. You know who I've been watching a lot lately? Oh, boy. Is Norm. Oh, yeah? And just the way he says draw, draw. you know, like with that, yeah, with that, you know, New England accent. Because I don't know if everybody knows this or not. The new Yankee workshop is now on YouTube. So um, they have started uploading all of the new Yankee workshop episodes to YouTube, which has been phenomenal. It's been super fun to watch. Now, I never watched Norm growing up. I'll admit it. I could be crucified for it. That's fine. <laughs> I, I watched David Marks. I didn't watch Norm. Yeah. You Norm might have been a little, little young before, for Norm. I say Norm was a little bit before my time. Um, but like how – like. I just love it. It's awesome. I've been like binge watching them whenever I can. Um, and my, my wife, like when she saw it was on, she's like, Oh my God, I used to watch this with my dad. So she sent a picture to her dad of the YouTube page with all of, all of them and stuff. And I, I know I mentioned this Phil to you uh, last week. I didn't realize that the new Yankee workshop was not Norm's shop. Ah. Like it was the producer of the show's shop. Yeah. Russell Marash. And they yeah. brought, yeah, and they brought Norm in as, like, the talent, you know, which I thought was kind of funny. So part of me kind of wants to make – so I have in my shop here, um, I have one six-foot-wide, seven-foot-tall door that's going to go from the shop into the storage area, yeah. kind of as a like, separate entrance into the shop. Right. These freaking French doors are so expensive. I kind of <laughs> want to just make, like, a sliding barn-style door right. like we have in the shop there on set. Yeah. 
I'm like, I kind of want to make like a replica of Norm's. I mean, it's not Norm's door, but like the new Yankee door. You totally should. Because it's kind of a cool craftsman style. Like, yeah. It could be a fun little throwback. Maybe I could get Norm to do the article about building that door and then install it. That'd be cool. Maybe. He's probably like, screw you guys. Yeah. Yeah. He'll big time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't we call that Matt cremona Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, shots fired. It's yep. the Cremona effect. Love you, Matt. <laughs> yeah. But not that much. <laughs> I mean, he is our boss as the producer of the Woods Mission. Right. Show. Yeah. We got a <laughs> yeah, we're so we got a letter in game the game. mail that was addressed to Matt Cremona, producer of the Woodsmith Shop. I'm not even sure how those two got connected, but there you go. Yeah. We'll get him on honorary name plaque right yep yep i enjoyed watching norm abrams because he was on when my dad was getting into woodworking Mm -hmm. and therefore it was just kind of interesting for me to see and i've always been interested by that kind of show of seeing how something gets put together and then was interested in woodworking anyway but he always I liked his shop and, you know, you could always make fun of the fact that it seemed like he had, he never had to change router bits in a router. He just changed routers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but his like back bench, um, hutch behind him was always mm-hmm. kind of a cool project. Yeah. You know, tons of drawers, lots of shelves and whatever in my shop, it would be a cluttered disaster, but, yeah. It was a cool project. Yeah, for me, it was Saturday morning cartoons and then New Yankee Workshop and this old house. And yep. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Like like yeah. you said, it just like watching shows on how things are made and put together. Yeah. So it was entertaining. It's funny. I, I've seen a lot of comments on like a lot of the Facebook pages saying, hey, Norm, you know, New York workshops now on YouTube and everyone's like making a big uproar about it, like how awesome it is. And then there's guys like me that never really watched Norm growing up. Um, so they're starting to watch it now. And it's funny. <laughs> I see so many comments where people are like, wow, just amazing what he could build with no tools. Like he doesn't even have a domino or anything. <laughs> I'm like, wow. really? Like, or like, Hey, you know, it was, it was cool. I saw a new technique on, on chopping mortises. You know, he drilled them out with a drill press and then chopped them. I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny because watching him and it's like, oh my gosh, he's got like every tool. He's got like every. I know. That's what I'm thinking too. I'm like, dude, it is a pretty set up shop. Like the first couple seasons, it's like, yeah, there's not as, as many. Right. Like that's before Delta jumped on with him. Mm-hmm. Um. But the guy was like, yeah, he doesn't even have a domino or a biscuit joint or anything. I'm like, really? Season one, episode two, he uses a biscuit joiner. Yeah. Like. He was into the yeah. he was into the biscuit joiner for a long time. I think that was I the say, reason Norm that like dad made got the one. market. Yeah. 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 Like Norm made Sold the market a lot of biscuit for the biscuit joiners. joiner. Yep. I mean, Ugh. he also had that big time saver belt sander in there at one point. You know, the one that's like the size of a yeah. Union Pacific yeah. locomotive. Mm-hmm. Yep. So yeah, no. Speaking of which, big big Sanders. Um, so I got an email the other day from a gentleman by the name of uh, Norman. Well, uh, the other day it was a couple weeks ago, several weeks ago. And I don't, I don't know if Norman listens to our podcast. I don't think he does, because well, a couple weeks ago we talked about um, the lathe I purchased, the Vic Mark, right. And how, you know, I was really interested in getting a, a big American-made lathe that was, you know, or I'm really interested in fitting my shop out with a bunch of American-made vintage machinery. And when we were talking about the lathe, and that's an Australian-made lathe, you know, I, I said, really the only lathe you can get that is going to have that same style of capacity would be like a American-made patterns maker, a pattern maker's lathe. Sure. I get an email from Norman, not three days later. Um, that said, Hey, I have an Oliver pattern makers lathe. If you're interested, I'm like, ah, twist my arm. Like I talked about not needing two lathes. Right. So I need to sell my little one, but 
I'm going to go pick up this Oliver Pattern Maker's Lathe from Norman. And the, the Pattern Maker's Lathe, I don't know if you guys know what they do. Um, they, they're like a, a weird combination of a metalworking lathe. So they have a traveling carriage on them that you can... Some of them are automatic feed where you flip a lever and the tool automatically moves. Sure. Some of them have hand wheels. Oh, okay. But then the headstock and tailstock will actually swivel as well. They'll swivel five degrees each direction for draft angles. So a pattern maker would make a wooden part to make sand casting molds out of. So it has to have draft angles to allow it to release from the molds. Oh, yeah, yeah. So so the everything actually swivels, articulates and stuff. And, and this doesn't have a Reeves drive on it. It has a, I don't remember what he said, if it was a five horse motor on it, a five horse 220 motor, it has a gearbox on it. So like there's an actual lever you shift the transmission, which is pretty awesome. Um, it weighs 2,000 pounds, according to the 1932 Oliver catalog I found. Oh, dude. Um, this is an eight-foot bed. This is going to be amazing. Like, am I dumb for doing this? Absolutely, 100%, and everybody needs to tell me this. But <laughs> it's going to be awesome. The whole point of this is, Norman also mentioned, if I was interested, I'd see how much he wants for it. He said he has a big... Um, stroke sander as well, which I don't know if you guys, uh, most people aren't familiar with the stroke sander. They're familiar with like heart attack sanders. You know, oscill- or- well, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's not John, it's you. I you was know? just waiting because uh, I thought I had to get in there. Otherwise, John yeah, was Yeah, I was thinking in my head and I'm just like, <laughs> nope, I'm going to let it go. Uh, <laughs> They'll pounce. Uh, uh, so most people are familiar with belt sanders, like a like a belt sander, like a planer, like a wide belt sander, or an edge sander or an oscillating edge sander. Right. A stroke sander is an edge sander flipped ninety degrees, but there's nothing in between the two rollers. Right. And what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to use a platen to push down on your part. Yeah. So like you put your part underneath the belt, the belt's running. You put your part underneath the belt, and then you use this platen. To push the belt down on your work and move it back and forth to sand the work. Yeah, um, they're an interesting machine. They're super cool. There's not a whole yeah. There's not a whole lot of people that use them unless it's in industry. Right. Yeah. And I don't know why that is. Um, I'm going to see when I. I mean, Norman lives about four hours away, over towards Illinois or over towards Chicago. Um, Norman uh, just little background on him because i think people are like here uh he was a retired pattern maker he was a one-man pattern maker shop for a long time which is why he has this lathe yeah which is why he has this stroke sander he was kind of doing it at a commercial level but as a one-man shop which is pretty awesome so and norman is a young spry 86 years old so all right um that's cool yeah he texted me pictures he texted me pictures of the lathe the other day so we'll put those on the show notes page so yeah be pretty awesome i remember seeing years and years ago fine woodworking had a couple of people that would send in and do articles on shop built machines yeah and they were very rube goldbergy kind of looking things and one of them was a a stroke sander Okay. And what's always fascinating to me is it seems like dust collection is almost impossible on that. <laughs> yeah, and I think you can't. the belts have to be like ordering the belt, you have to do it either in kilometers or miles. I just there's <laughs> just no Well, and there's a there's two reasons for that. One is the belt needs to cool down as it's running, right? right? And you want to be a low sand super wide panels. or long panels yeah yeah mm-hmm. yeah so yeah huh that sounds like you you'd have to there'd be a little bit of learning curve on a stroke sander like a little bit of finesse yeah i would maybe. think so i remember seeing boy where did i see was a video of a guy who had what did he make now it was like an old barn somewhere in the northeast and he had a stroke sander and it just was just clouds and clouds of dust around it and yeah so i wonder if it's a if it's a european tool or something you know more familiar for like boat building or something where you'd have yeah because you could do like really odd shapes with it because that lower part of the belt is totally flexible so you can you know hold all kinds of weirdo curved surfaces up to it yeah like and it's funny because the biggest 
the biggest ones that they made. So most of them are, you know, I don't know, 60 inches wide. So you could put, you could put like a five foot panel. In yeah. There, um, if you're doing cabinets or something, but the biggest examples of these were cast iron and they were actually three parts. So you would, you could put the two ends as far apart as you wanted. And they would, they looked like the old kind of camel, they call them camel back or camel hump um, drill presses. Yeah. And they were cast iron, so you'd bolt them to the floor, however far apart you wanted. And then there was a separate table or cast iron bed that would go in between them. So it was kind of like a make your own, you know, choose your own adventure on how big you wanted. And I could really see those being used for like, yeah, like huge boat buildings or, you know, big architectural dome pieces. Oh, yeah. Something like that, which would be pretty cool. So, I don't know. Again, unnecessary machines I don't really need. And as these opportunities arise, I'm in the middle of doing electrical in my shop and I'm like, shoot, we really need to add another outlet. Right. Another outlet, another outlet, another outlet. And all of a sudden I'm out of electricity. <laughs> Ran out. Do they make 220 power strips? <laughs> well, I think more of my panels running out of power. Should have went with 300 amp. Dang it. I want to thank Tight Bond for their sponsorship of this episode. You want a glue that you can trust. And fortunately, Tight Bond has the glue you need to get the job done with confidence. From interior glues with strong initial tack and short clamp time to exterior glues with exceptional strength and water resistance. Look to Tight Bond, the right glue for your next project. For more information, visit tightbond.com. All right, John, what do you got? Oh, I don't know. It's hard working out in the at, at home and at home projects because it's so cold. So doing a lot here, I guess. Yeah. Did I, uh, I don't know. I I don't know if I mentioned this on the podcast, but building a the compact router for a guy. Hmm. That bought the plans. Right. And uh, was having tr- trouble building it. It's like, oh, I can help you out. He kind of talked me into it. So it's been kind of an ongoing thing for the last month to huh. six weeks. And it's like, it's a small project that you could get done in a weekend, but just kind of gorilla woodworking, jumping in at lunch and working on it 15 minutes here, 20 minutes <laughs> there. So it's so been how a process. Are you getting it to him? I just. Ship it somehow, I guess. I haven't, I haven't got to that point yet. <laughs> Let's not look too far ahead. Yeah. So, but <laughs> I mean, it's not. It's problem. like a box. I mean, it's the compact router. It's not. Yeah. So you just slap a label on the router plate. Right. Yep. Send it. Yep. I don't know. I got an air fryer box. I think it'll fit into. It's about the size of an air fryer. Yeah. So, yeah. That's true. We'll see. We'll see. Hmm. You know. So, that's what I've been working on, kind of, on my off time. Right. When I can find time. So it's fun. It's a fun little project. I like those little shop projects that you just can build with scrap plywood and hardware you find around the shop. So yeah, it's always a good time. There really isn't much very large pieces on that. So that is kind of cool. Right. Yeah. It's like, I can, I find feel like those, stuff. those little shop projects make it easier to build a tool for a specific purpose too. Like, I don't like I have a big router table. I don't really I mean unless a big vintage one comes up. I don't really need another router table. <laughs> but it would sure be nice to set up like that little router table with a permanent just screw a fence down for a quarter inch groove at a quarter inch from the bottom. You know what I mean? Oh. So that it's always set up to do drawer bottoms or drawer boxes. Right. Yeah. It's like always there, always ready. It's like Norm's forty five yeah, router. That's what I was gonna say. Has. Speaking of Norm Abrams, <laughs> yeah. having like a dedicated tool to something. Yeah, have your router stable. Yep. So, yeah, I I don't know. I always kind of like those compact routers. I have a you know a Craig router table at home, and it seems to take up a lot of space for for what I do at home. So yeah. it's like, mm-hmm. I don't know if I just need something compact that I can tuck away and have floor space or something else. So yeah, I uh, I shot a f- couple photos actually that pen box right behind Phil on the shelf with Doug Stowe down in Arkansas. Yep, that one right there. Um, 
with Doug Stowe down in Arkansas, and he's he's really well known for his boxes. I mean, Doug's an excellent craftsman. He's a fantastic craftsman. Teaches a lot at Mark Adams. Um, teaches all over. Um, but his router table is literally a piece of plywood with a roller a router base screwed to the bottom and a pivoting fence on it. And he's like, I do boxes. Like I don't need a big router table. Mm-hmm. So he just takes the rotor the router motor out and throws it behind his bench, you know. He's like, oh, why do I need a big router table? Um, so he just grabs a couple F clamps, clamps it on. So No, his router is table right? is uh is pretty cool. And that was kind of yeah. I was inspired by like you said, he has the pivoting fence on there, which is mm-hmm. pretty interesting and a nice way to yeah. quickly set the fence and adjust it. Cause you can have, you know, it just has the pivot on the far end clamp on the near end. So you can just take a mallet and, mm-hmm. you know, like tap, tap one way or the other and yep. make mm-hmm. fine adjustments. Yeah. Yeah. I always thought it would be a interesting either tip or project that like a, a router base that you could clamp into your bench vice to turn into a router. Cause you know, you've seen Chris Fitch do that where he just clamps the router into yeah. the vice. It's I've like, done it a few it, times. Yeah, too. I mean, it works great. It works great, but it's like, so you could have a little bit bigger plate. Maybe you could snap on a little tiny fence or something to make it or have it like mount a little bit better. So it's a little bit safer. You're not trying to clamp the round base into the, into the vice or I don't know. Maybe there's something there. Or, or you just, ooh, this is a shop notes thing. Mm-hmm. have a modular workbench that has an area where you can pull the insert out, put the router plate insert in, and then different attachments. Yep. Bench vice goes in there, machinist vice. All right. Movable There's something here. section. There's something there. It needs yep. a little massaging. Yep. It needs a little fiddling. Yeah. Chris Fitchett. Yep. <laughs> There's something there. I'm excited to see John. You designed. A, we talked about this a few episodes ago. A shop cart for mm-hmm. shop notes uh, that is designed off of one that Logan found, made by Coleman mm-hmm. of the Lantern fame. Uh and I, we were trying to decide paint colors for it the other day. Because even though it's mostly plywood and you can totally let it be plywood, but we were thinking that we would do paint on it. And we were debating whether to do like a, a Kennedy toolbox, brown. coppery brown yep. textured or wrinkled finish on it. So that'll be kind of cool to yep. see that. Is that what we decided? <laughs> I believe so. Dylan's waiting. So. Yes. Dylan's waiting on paint coming in and he'll paint it. Okay. So yeah, I, was gonna say, I haven't, I haven't been in the shop yet this week, so I don't know if it had been started painting yet. So no, I'm cause he was oh, Mark's out. Mark's out. Yeah. yeah. Mark's in yeah. Antigua. Ah. Okay. Yeah. I think it'd be cool. Cause it's like, it kind of has the same like Kennedy toolbox type vibes. Okay. You know what I mean? Like it, it, I've, Again, going back to my problems in my life, I've looked at a lot of vintage Kennedy stuff to potentially buy it because it's 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 well made American made stuff. Right. I mean, it's it's just nicely made toolboxes. You go to a you go to a machinist shop, most of them are going to be using Kennedy toolboxes or Gerstner or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it it just gives me the same vibes. Like, I want the Americana of it. Right. <laughs> All right. That's fair. I like when we do that kind of stuff because we've done a couple of vintage inspired projects for shop notes. I mean, we've done a bunch of them furniture wise in Woodsmith, but for the shop projects too. You know, I think some of Chris's tools, like even some of his power tools, he takes cues from like old castings machine based castings from like the thirties and forties when they still have that very rounded streamlined look to it rather than kind of that angular bent steel value engineered sort of thing. Yep. So yeah, that'll be kind of, I'm really, that one will be a fun one to see. Yeah. 
Might need John to paint the wheels though. Yeah. I'll just dip them. Bright. Just dip them. They're bright orange. Yeah. I think it'll still work. I think it'll be fine. Yeah. That's what Photoshop's for. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. I was, I was sitting here writing that article this week or this weekend. And I'm like, some of these sizes don't line up like something <laughs> in my head. And it's funny, like after, after doing these, you know, writing these type of projects for five or six years now, it's like, I'm like, something here just doesn't seem like it's meshing right. Mm-hmm. And so I was sending John messages over the weekend, like, hey, can you check your model on this? He's like, oh, yeah, Mark found that when he was yeah. building. Yeah, imagine <laughs> building it from those plans. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. Well, well, it's, it, my point there is it's funny because even when you design something in CAD, mm-hmm. which basically is what we're doing, or, you know, even SketchUp. Like, I, I've done a lot of my pop wood projects in SketchUp um, because that's how we do our, our artwork. Um Stuff still comes up. <laughs> like right. it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter how baked your plan is. You know, it still still is underdone at yeah. some point. Yeah, because yeah, it should be like perfect in the computer. You should be able to catch you know yeah. stuff that doesn't. But it's still there's always something. And then as yep. he's as he's building it, you know, I have all the like drawer sizes and drawer front sizes. But then it's like you build the case and it's. Uh, plywood's not exactly three quarters of an inch. So then you, you know, stuff starts to kind of change. So then you're, you're just building from what you have rather than Mm -hmm. from the plans, you know, you're just building to fit at that point. So kind of just get like, it's a metaphor for life. Yeah. You're just building to fit. Yeah. The plans are just kind of like the lines on the road. It's just a suggestion, (laughs) you know, just kind of stay in that area. Right. Just kind of stay in the area. Just a general idea. Super funny. All right. Well, I think that does it for another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. Uh, I'm going to have links to some of the photos and things that we were talking about in today's episode. I'm also going to put a link for this episode's free plan. And we were talking about uh, organizing things. And uh, one project that we did for the TV show a few years ago was called a dresser top valet. And it was a little box that's designed to keep kind of the things you carry around every day in when you don't need them anymore, your everyday carry, so to speak. So I will put a link for that project. It's a pretty quick and easy one to do. And it has a really fun curved fluted lid. That's a a really fun router table technique on there. And I think you'd be able to find other uses for that as well. So you can check that out uh, on our show notes page at woodsmith.com slash podcasts. And I'd also appreciate it if you could review the show on your local podcast provider to help the shop notes podcast to get out to more people. Otherwise, you can email me any questions, comments, or smart remarks at woodsmith at woodsmith.com or leave a comment in our YouTube channel where you'll also find other woodworking videos and inspiration. Want to say a special thanks to Tightbond. You want a glue that you can trust, and fortunately, Tightbond has the glue you need to get the job done with confidence. From interior glues with strong initial tack and short clamp time, to exterior glues with exceptional strength and water resistance. Look to Tightbond the right glue for your next project. For more information, visit tightbond.com. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you next week on the Shop Notes podcast. Bye.